forward versus the revenues we expect to bring in through taxes and other revenue sources. Now, those numbers should be identical. We're very close to it if we were fiscally responsible. But if we're not, we bring it forward to today's dollars. There's a gap there. That's called a fiscal gap. It sits right now at $211 trillion. That's a staggering amount of money. I, I, I made that announcement uh, when I announced my candidacy in Detroit in May. And the next day, liberal newspapers came out. See, we told you Carson didn't know what he's talking about. Fiscal guy, what is he talking about? Nobody in economics believes that. That's just craziness. And then the day after that, Forbes came out with an article that said 17 Nobel laureates in economics and 1,200 professors of economics agree with Carson. <laughs> But you'll notice politicians don't talk about this. They don't talk about the fiscal gap because they want to be reelected. Uh, and they're afraid that they may look like they're scaring people. But I'm not a politician, so I can talk about it. And it's, I think it's important that people understand the condition we're in. The only reason we can sustain that level of debt is because we can print money. We are the reserve currency of the world. A position that generally goes with the number one economy in the world, which we were from the 1870s until last year when China became the number one economy. Mm -hmm. Would they like to be the reserve currency? Of course they would. They're having all kinds of troubles right now with their money, as you can see. If they can print money, they can do a lot of stuff. Uh, and they're working on it, believe me. But right now, we have a bit of a reprieve. I don't know how long it's going to last, but i got to tell you, we got to wake up. Because if we don't do something about this soon, what happened with the crash in 1929 will be a walk in the park compared to what we're going to experience in this country. And uh, the, the, the thought that we can just continue to escalate the debt, it's almost treasonous. And when you hear politicians coming in here and telling you, oh, we're going to give you this, and we're going to make college free, and we're going to do all this stuff. Guess what? They are talking about accelerating the destruction of this nation. And it's imperative that the people of this country understand that and understand what's going on so that they will then understand what has to be done. And if we begin soon taking corrective action we will do much better the longer we wait the more draconian the measures will have to be in order to get us back on the right course and this is absolutely the truth and what's going to be necessary is for every single person in here to take some responsibility what you need to do is think about the pre-revolutionary days in this country. The Americans did not like the dictatorial style of King George III. And they started having town hall meetings, getting together in their barns and their living rooms and in the town center. And they started talking about what kind of country were they willing to fight for? What kind of country were they willing to die for? They invited everybody, even the loyalists. They invited them all. And they were able to encourage each other, to strengthen each other to the point that a ragtag bunch of militiamen was able to defeat the most powerful military force on earth. That's what we need to do again. Everybody in here has a sphere of influence. <coughs> You need to get your friends, your family, your extended family, your co-workers, your neighbors, people together in your home or wherever. You need to begin discussing these issues that affect not only our lives, but the lives of our children and our grandchildren and the future of our nation. Because only when we understand these issues can we do the right thing? Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson emphasized so strongly that our freedom 
And our system of government is based upon a well-informed and educated populace. And they said, if we ever become other than that, the nature of the, ch of the nation will change. Why? Because it will be very easy for slick politicians and dishonest media to drive the vote and tell people things and they would believe it. Just to give you an example, you got people telling you today how wonderful our economy is, that the unemployment rate is down to 5.3%. You know, that is essentially full employment. But your eyes tell you different. And if you're informed, you know that the real measure is the labor force participation rate, the number of people who are eligible to work who are actually working, which is at a 37-year low. But if you don't know that, it's real easy to manipulate you. And you think, oh, wow, wow, this is great. All these policies are really working. And it's, they depend on people not being informed in order to pull this garbage off. And those are the kinds of things you need to talk about to your friends and neighbors. If everybody in here makes it their goal to get three people involved and in voting who didn't vote in 2012, that will be tremendous. Just three people. Because in 2012, 93 million people who could have voted didn't vote. 30 million evangelicals did not vote. And you know what? When you don't vote, you are voting. And you gotta make sure that people understand that. You are voting. But what they're voting for is not traditional America. It's a completely different system. And this is gonna be the clearest election, I think, ever. It's gonna be a choice of up for and by the people, or up for and by the government. And it's going to be extraordinarily clear. Assuming that you know we have a Republican candidate who is not too much like the Democrats. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, but, but we can make that change and recognize that we would not have the freedoms that we have today if those who preceded us had been afraid. They were afraid to put their lives on the line, to put their resources on the line. And they did that for us. They didn't do it for themselves. And now we have an opportunity to be the ones. You know, I look around here, I see some some young people here. You know, how can we, how can we squander their future? How can we just think about ourselves when so many did so much for us in the past? Thank you.
pregnancy is nine months old. Not anybody knows that we have pro life and pro choice. Those are great questions. Nobody can look at on themselves, except from a religious perspective, and say, well, that's a big Likewise, nobody can look at a day, baby, the day before his birth, born, and say, killing that is murder. They have to look at that and say, it's murder. They look at themselves and say, it's not okay. I made a mistake. It's her body. It's her life. There's a whole transition between how do you bring the two sides together to recognize them and say, look, we have to have that discussion. It's a process. Let's, let's solve this problem. I think that's exactly right. Discussion. That is the key. Being able to sit down together and have a rational discussion. That's one of the reasons that I hate political correctness. Because political correctness shuts down the discussion. You're not supposed to say this word. You're not supposed to say this phrase. You're not supposed to talk about this issue. And consequently, you know, it just continues on under the surface. Uh, and I, I believe that it is uh, the social progressives who are the biggest imposers of political correctness because they don't want that discussion to occur. You know, I've said, for instance, about the issue of the minimum wage. Let's sit down at the table, both sides, and let's put all the pros and cons on the table and let's have an open discussion about the issue. Let's come to a conclusion. And then whatever we decide on, let's index it to economic factors so that we never have to have this discussion again in the history of America. You know, but it can't happen unless we're willing to have the discussion. So that's very important. Yes. Hi. Uh, so I saw the news of the climate change and the real climate change is irrelevant. Um, I just want to point out that in New Hampshire, we've been actually seeing the effects of climate change in other years. The increase in climate change is happening in the more here to the population because of climate change. And there's just effects of it you can see everywhere. Um, I was just wondering, have plans for what you do about Okay. Well, first of all, when I say the discussion is irrelevant, the reason it's irrelevant is because any reasonable person knows that they have a responsibility to take care of the environment. And what I would do, instead of getting into a big argument about whether the temperature is going up or the temperature is going down, it's simply to say, again, let's sit down and discuss reasonable measures that can be taken. And we should have the Environmental Protection Agency not working to suppress our energy, but instead working with business, industry, academia to find the cleanest, most environmentally friendly ways to take advantage of our resources. That will report. And the amount of money that they could generate can be used to fund research into alternative energy. You know, we sit between two oceans, but we're not taking advantage of the hydroelectric power there. I mean, there's all kinds of energy. And we need to be looking at those. But in the meantime, we can use the energy resources that we have in a, in a very wise way. We now have the ability, for instance, to liquefy natural gas, which means we can export it. But we have these archaic energy exportation rules that were put in place in the 70s during the energy crisis. There's absolutely no reason for those. We need to get rid of those and begin exporting energy because one of the reasons that Putin has so much influence in Europe is because he's the energy king there. Why don't we make them dependent on us for energy? So we can decrease his influence. 
So, you know, wise economic uh, policies tie in to our other types of foreign policy and can make a huge difference in our country. Uh, let's come back to this side. How uh, will you convince some of us who are so dependent on the government for their very lives financially and, and on many other ways to vote for you? Okay. Well, I will hopefully convince you by helping you to realize that if we continue just depending on the government to give you money that they have to borrow, that eventually nobody's going to have anything and we're all going to collapse. And that we have to start thinking in a logical way. And one of the things I think that's going to help tremendously is if we get the economic engine moving again, which means let's get rid of some of the unnecessary regulations. We have way, way too many regulations. You know, Dodd-Frank, for instance, uh, you know, I, I, I think that is very unnecessary. The financial debt that it goes into, you know, sitting on corporate boards for decades, I can tell you, it, it does a lot more harm than it does good. And the other thing that people don't recognize is that every single regulation that we impose costs money. It increases the price of goods and services, which disproportionately hits poor people. That's one of the reasons that income gap is growing the way it is, because they have to pay so much for all of this regulatory control. And we also need a different kind of tax code and lower those corporate taxes. I would go for a tax holiday, a six month tax holiday on corporate taxes so that the two plus trillion dollars overseas can be repatriated to this country. And it would cost our taxpayers one penny. And the only stipulation I would make is that 10% of it had to be used to create jobs for unemployed people and people on welfare. But you want to talk about the stimulus that doesn't cost us any money. That would do it. Yes. Thank you for coming to the doctor. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Brooke Warren, State Representative for Maryland County. My question is on the military. Our military situation is a result of 20 years of people making decisions and little or no experience in the military. How do you avoid being one more person in the long run and people with little or no experience making decisions about the future of our military? Uh, very good question. Uh, I have a number of extraordinary military advisors, and uh, they are very smart people. I've always had a very strong relationship with military people uh, throughout my career. Probably started back when I was in high school, I joined ROTC, and I became the city executive officer for Detroit, met General Westmore, and I went to Congressional Medal of Honor, Tenders with him offered a full scholarship to West Point, but I decided to go the medicine route instead. But I have great respect for the military and the military minds. And I guarantee you that if we give them a mission and let them do it without tying their hands behind their back and micromanaging, they can do it. If you could get RU486 immediately after the rape, then that can be a contraceptive. It will, it will keep it from occurring. But it has to be immediately. The morning after is too late. Yes. Thank you for taking my question, Dr. Uh, here. I currently serve in the National Guard. Thank you. So I can't speak for 
how do all these cuts that we made in the military by the current administration still yeah. affecting us? Maybe some of the higher enlisted are not able to re-enlist. People that would be highly qualified to enlist are not able to enlist because right. the standing is so difficult. But my question is about ISIS. I want to know they, these threats that they've made, you may be as a current uh, member of the Army, very nervous. Sure. I feel that with all these cuts, this administration is not engaging them seriously. They're using some of our military equipment. They're actually paying some of their black folks with our money that we've given to people over there. Sure. Um, if you were elected as opposed to Senator Sanders or former Secretary Clinton, who I don't think will take them seriously, what would you do to show that you're taking these folks seriously and you can try to prevent them? Good question. You know, a lot of people, you know, equate what's going on now with what happened in 2003 when we went over and uh, invaded Iraq, which I actually did not agree with. I had many discussions with President Bush about that. Um, but that is a very different situation. We lost a lot of men. We lost a lot of money. And a lot of Americans say, we don't want to repeat that mistake. That is the wrong way to think. Because that was not an existential threat to us, and this is. We have radical jihadists who now wish to destroy us and everything that has to do with us. And they are growing rapidly, and they are able to attract a lot of people because it looks like they're winning. You know, they've acquired half of Iraq, a third of Syria. They've now got a foothold in Tunisia, in Nigeria. They are expanding. They have their caliphate, and they're making it grow, and they look victorious. So it's easy for them to attract people. What I would do is recognize that it's either us or them. And I would use every resource available, uh, both economic resources and military resources, offensive and defensive resources, I would take the land from them because that is a crucial part of their appearing to be victorious. Remove the land from them, including the oil. You know, you've got an Anbar, you've got the Akash oil fields, one of the biggest oil fields there under the control of ISIS, I take it from them. And I not only take everything from them, but I would give our military the mission of wiping them out, completely destroying them, not leaving a single one anywhere. And I guarantee you that they could do it if we let them do it and don't tie their hands behind their back and tell them you know, that we're watching every move they make and uh, we're going to persecute them and we're going to do, you know, that's a bunch of crap. You know, as I said during the, as I said during the uh, debate, there is no such thing as a politically correct war. You know, if you're going to have a politically correct war, then just make a rule that says no war. You know, otherwise, you know, you're making rules for your people, tying their hands behind their back.